This message comes to you from King's Church Wirral, UK. We hope that as you listen, you will be encouraged, blessed and inspired. So a couple of weeks ago, me and Steph went uh, up to the Lake District for a family holiday. Uh, we towed the caravan up. We went to a small little village just outside Keswick called Braithwaite. Anyone know the Lake District? You know Braithwaite? Lovely little village. Got a nice little pub there, um, which our boys would not be quiet in. So we had to take them home, and I was not happy. <laughs> Uh, we were quite tired leading up to the holiday, but about, about, by about day three, we were feeling a bit more chilled out, I'd say. The kids had actually had bad first night on holiday, obviously, they're going to have a bad night's sleep. Then we settled that, they'd had a good night's sleep, and we were beginning to relax, and we thought, today is the day we are going to take them up a mountain. Now, the site we were staying on was actually at the foot of a mountain, which was the very first mountain Zadok ever went up. Uh, Zadok was how old, Steph? 18 months, something like that? Seven months was it really that young? <laughs> so the first mountain Zadok went over and up, and in that case, I actually carried him up the mountain. He's in one of those children's backpacks, and I carried him all the way up the mountain. Um, but he was really excited about the prospect of climbing the mountain that he'd already been on top of, but he didn't know. Um, and we succeeded. Both boys made it up to the mountain. And they made it back again, and their tiny little toddler legs got all the way there and all the way back. They slept pretty well that night. Inspired by our success at taking two children up a mountain, we decided to go for a slightly more challenging mountain. The first mountain we went up was Babo. Uh, the second mountain was Cat Bells. Uh, it's still not by any means a hard mountain to climb as an adult, but for a kid it is. Um, whereas Babo had been more of a hike, Cat Bells definitely was more of a scramble. There are times on the walk where there is no clear path. There's just rocks you've got to get up. And to make matters harder, the day was quite wet and quite windy. It was a great adventure. It really was. But there came points on the walk where, as a dad, I had to take charge. Not of Steph. No, 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 I don't mean that. Or of my children. And it brought to light a really interesting contrast between my two boys. Zadok, who's a bit older... He's had, an ex he's had experienced life with me a little bit more. He understood when it was time to listen to Daddy. I would say, put your left foot here. I would say, pull up with your arms. Look, go as far as that ledge. Don't go any further until I reach you. Don't go up that path. It's too slippy. Come up this one. It's safer. And this was absolutely fine because Zadok did. Asa, however... Is still learning. There are the times where he just needs to do what he's told. Now, you might think that that trait comes from me. You would be wrong. That is absolutely a Steph thing. And if you are interested, Cole has the videos from her youth to prove it. <laughs> right? But if I said, don't go that way, Asa, his thought was, why? What's that way? And he would go that way, he'd get stuck, and I'd have to try and bring him back. I'd have to scramble up a way that wasn't a good way to go, pick him up and bring him back down. Or I might say, look, this way, there's, there's the steps there. That's just the slippery rock face. Off he goes to the slippery rock face. Can't get up and has to come back. No, come up the stepped path. That bit's better. Now, for the most part, it wasn't a problem. If I'm being honest with you, it's kids being, having fun on a walk. But there were two or three times on the walk where there was genuine risk to the boys. Genuine risk. Now, I'm not a dad. Those of you who know me and have seen me parenting from day one of my children, I am not a dad that says, you might get hurt, don't do that. I'm more of a dad that says, you might get hurt, take more care while you're doing that. I don't want to tell my children not to take risks. I want, them to just I want to teach them to manage that risk and measure that risk and take appropriate response to that risk. But on this occasion, on this walk, there were times where it went, probably for the first time, <laughs> you will get hurt unless you do exactly what I say. 
That's where we got to. And it was very, very windy. I can't understate the fact that Asa could have been taken off the top. He's only little blessing. As a dad, it was my responsibility to bring my children through that safely. To get them home unharmed. More than that, it was to help them love the adventure on the way. It wasn't just about getting them home, it was about helping them love it. My ability to do that was either extremely helped or extremely hindered by their willingness to trust me and do what I said. Either very helped or very hindered. Um, don't think bad of Asich just because he's younger. Zadok was like, well, he wasn't really, but... Um, now, that story acts as quite a nice little parallel analogy for what I really feel God wants to say to us today. I feel God wants to invite us to a new understanding or a deeper understanding or maybe to remind us of something that will cause us to be closer to him and in being closer to him, be closer to who he created us to be. As we know God more, we know self more. As we know self more, we know God more. These two grow with one another. But I really feel that like what God wants to do, and I, I, hope I've, I hope I say this right, is this is not a rebuke, it's an invitation. It's an invitation by God. It begs the question, what's an invite? Well, I have an invitation here. Look, you can tell that it's an invitation from God because it says an invitation from God. I wonder what your response to this invite is. What's your response to the invite? Because let me tell you something about invitations. Um, what our response to an invite is, is a reflection of our response to the inviter. And our response to the inviter is a reflection of what we think of the inviter. You know, I'm just going to uh, stand that up there so you can see it. Um, when midweek... I'm exhausted from work, and Steph says, do you want to do something on Saturday? I don't have to ask, what were you thinking we might do together? Before I say, yes. Because of course I want to spend my weekend with Steph. What we do is irrelevant. My response to that question is my response to Steph. Similarly, when I ask Steph to marry me, she did not, when I said, will you marry me? She had absolutely no clue what saying yes meant. <laughs> and if you think, if you think when you say yes to a question like that, you know what you're getting in for, you're a fool. No. Steph's response of yes was not, okay, I'll plan a wedding with you. Yep, no problem. We'll do that. Yeah, uh, it wasn't. Her response to the invite to marry me was her response to me based on what she knew of me. Our, same is, our, is true of our response to God. Today, God is inviting you. What's your question? What's the question? What's he inviting me to? When our response, when we know God, that's not a question we ask. Which is an interesting thing. When we know God, that is not a question we ask. What is he inviting me to? The invite alone is enough to say yes. So as I've saw God for a word today, I think this is what he wants to say. I feel God wants to invite us to make him Lord and Savior. Don't switch off thinking that this is an evangelistic message. God has really said to me, no, I want to invite my people to make me Lord and Saviour. It's a common term in Christian easing, isn't it? Lord and Saviour. I can't find it anywhere in the Bible. It might be there in some translation, but I googled the Bible for Lord and Saviour, and that actual expression together, I couldn't find it. There's loads about Lord, loads about Saviour, but we know what we mean. So um, I started pondering this term. What does it mean to make God Lord and Saviour? I considered what it means for God to be Lord. This was my idea. You know, having been a good Sunday school kid, Having read my Bible a bit over the years, I know that making God Lord means to recognize he is in charge. He is the master. More than that, if I have made Jesus Lord, 
It really means that every decision I make is run through a new metric of decision-making thinking, a new framework for life. When I am Lord, the framework is, will this decision benefit me? That's the, that's the way I make decisions, when I'm Lord. Will it make me happier? Taking that job, will it make me richer? Will it make my family better? Will it make my prosperity or my uh, whatever? It's about what is good for me, and fair enough. But when I make God Lord, the question switches. What would be most beneficial for him? What's most beneficial for him and his kingdom, for his purposes on earth? The way Paul puts that, it is no longer I that live, but Christ through me or Christ in me. Now, there have been some, I, in my opinion, subversive parts of church teaching that have tried to marry these two together and say that because Jesus wants the best for us, picking what's best for us means it's what's best for what Jesus would want. No. I mean, just black and white, no. There might be overlap. But the, if the motivation in my decision is fundamentally what's best for me, I would, I would ask that question. To make Jesus Lord means to change the way I live my life in consideration of his plans and purposes, not my own. There will be overlap, but there is not necessarily overlap. So that seemed like a good answer to me when I was praying about this. Check. Good answer, Ben. Well done. Make Jesus Lord. And then I asked, I wonder what it means to make Jesus Savior. Again, the Sunday schooler in me says that I am destined to eternal torment due to my sin, but Jesus died on the cross so that when I face judgment, he will step in and save me from that and bring me into his eternal dwelling. And I thought, good answer. I've made Jesus savior. I trust his grace. Our work through the cross will be sufficient for my soul's redemption. And I was praying on this and God corrected me. He said, I didn't say I was inviting you to make me Lord and make me Savior. I was inviting you to make me Lord and Savior. Why have you separated those two things? And why have you pushed it to the future? I know, and I, I hope you know, that when God says he is our Savior, he does not only mean with regards to our eternal dwelling place. I really hope you understand that. It is not about waiting till death for that. The Bible actually, and I can say this, people will push back, and I'm sure you will, it's not really all that clear on eternal dwelling place thinking. And I know it's not that clear because there are literally hundreds of books opposing one another from people who know their scriptures. So you might go, oh no, it's really clear. Well, okay, you have that view, but let's be honest, there's argument. There is argument and there is debate and there is good thinking on various different views on this. So it makes me think it's, it's not really that what it's about. What is clear is that when we come to Jesus, we are not as he would want us to be. Sin has corrupted the good creation that God made. God wants to restore us to his plans and purposes. And the work of God in redeeming us to what he wants us to be is one that happens in cooperation with the Holy Spirit working in and through us. It is engaging with his purposes for us. Therefore, Having God as Savior is not primarily about what happens to us when we die. It is about God's plans for us when we are alive. It is about him changing us, shaping us, and moving us more and more into the life he destined for us within his kingdom. From the moment I say yes to Jesus, to the day I die, he is saving me. Each day I live, I can look to him 
to be saviour. Each day is a new day to recognise that there are things in my life which are the remnant of the corruption of sin. That are not his ways, that are not good. And each day God wants to move me further towards his plans. What the Bible might describe as being moved from one degree of glory to another. But how? How does this process happen? How does God perform this work of saving me? It is certainly not by doing it for me. Now, God does work that way. But I'd argue it's not really what is described when the word saving is said. A closer word for when God just does it is the word deliverance. God will deliver Which is why what I think God wants to say today is, I'm inviting you to go beyond looking for delivery and choose to walk with me in saving. Let me give you an example of this. When Israel was in slavery in Egypt, God brought them out by his powerful, mighty, miraculous hand. He delivered them from Egypt. He did the work. He sent the plagues. He changed Pharaoh. He parted the sea. The delivery was because of the work of God in that point. But once delivered, what did that look like? Because it didn't look saved. They were out of the hands of the captives, but they were not where God wanted them to be. It was their obedience to God, working with God through the leadership of Joshua, being brought into the promised land that was their salvation. And during the time between being delivered and being brought into the promised land, lots of them didn't trust God. So they wanted to go back to Egypt. They want, or they grumbled, or they settled in the wilderness. But being delivered wasn't saving them. So the question I'd ask is, could God save those people? Well, I'm not sure. He could keep delivering them. He could keep delivering them. But God is in the business of saving. He wants to save, not just to perpetually deliver. You know, when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, his question, I'm going to paraphrase here for the sake of time, his question was, What must I do to have the life that you are offering? Paraphrased in most translations as, what must I do? Sorry, phrased in most translations as, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to have this life you are offering? Jesus' answer was, live the law. Do it God's way. And he says, I've always done that. So Jesus adds, okay, do money the way I do money. Do money the way I do money. You're not doing money the way I do money. You can't have the life. You can't have it. Give it all away so that that is not what you are aiming for in life. Aim for me and my kingdom. That's how you have this life. In order for God to to save in this way, in order for God to be savior, we must return to the concept of him being Lord. For God to bring us into everything he has for us, we must choose his way, not our own. We must recognize that his way of doing things is better than the natural choices we might make. To look to Jesus as Savior is the same thing as to recognize him as Lord. They are not separable. You can't have one without the other. Another example, you know, at the moment we're in a time of massive financial pressure. Everyone's feeling this. Most people are feeling this squeeze. International summits are being organized to try to work out how to fix this stuff. And many Christians look at their finances and are crying out to God for help. Now, let's say you're in massive debt. This is is a a semi-autobiographical story. Uh, Let's say you're in massive debt. I remember being this way a few years ago. Massive debt. Made loads of mistakes in our finances in our early marriage, and we were loads of debt. And honestly, we would pray. We go, God, why don't you just stick a check through our letterbox? 
Why? You know there's millionaire Christians out there. I might know some because nobody talks about money because we're British, right? I know there's millionaire Christians out there. Why don't you just tell one of them? Write a check for 20 grand, stick it in bed. That'll save us. No, it wouldn't have. It would have delivered us, and a few years later, we'd have been back in debt. We'd have just been right back there because we would not have learned to do money the way God does money. No, for God to be saviour in the situation requires us to make God lord of the situation. If you want to see God's saving hand in finance, make God lord of finances. Do it the way he does it. And if you don't, what you're really saying is, actually, God, I don't think the way you do money is going to work. Which is a very bold move. You know, good luck with that. We have to do money the way God does money. Maybe your marriage is struggling. For God to save marriage requires us to do marriage how God does marriage. For him to be saviour means him to be Lord. We must make God Lord and saviour, not one or the other, because they're the same thing. Maybe there are challenges in relationships that you want to see healed, past hurt from friendships. How does God do conflict and hurt? A lot of you don't want to answer that question because you know what it means. How does God do conflict and hurt? He forgives. He forgives. If we want to see God save this, we must recognize his lordship. When we come to God and say, God, I want all of your kingdom. I want to be forgiven. I want that. And then we walk away and go, actually, God, that part of your kingdom about forgiving that person that hurt me, I'm not all that up for that. What we're saying is, yeah, I want you to save me, but I'm not going to make you Lord. It's not possible because the work of engaging with God's ways is what brings us into what he has created us to be. Lord and Savior are together. We have to learn to deal with pain and hurt the way God deals with pain and hurt. That's how we get saved from it. That's how we come into what God goes on. The list goes on, okay? What about physical health? Physical health. You know, we cry out for God for healing while not making Lord or God Lord of our diet. Oh, Ben, you're a bit close to the bone there, aren't you, Ben? Oh, that's a bit harsh. You know what? This has been a real challenge for me this week. A real challenge. I'm going to give testimony to something here. Last week, Steph spoke about taking Christ's yoke. Here it is. This was the yoke we used. Used for guiding oxen. There it is. Um, and how by putting this on, it brings us rest. Putting this on, it brings us rest. Doing good God's way brings us rest. Um, recently, I changed jobs, as many of you know. I went from being a teacher to being an office worker. That meant I went from 10,000 steps a day to virtually sed sedative in an office chair. Not sedative. Sedate. That's the one. Maybe some of you right now are thinking sedative. I, I will try to hurry up. Um, being virtually sedate in an office chair. And I started noticing the weight creep up. I started noticing myself finding it a little bit harder to get motivated to do things. Started just seeing these things go on. And then one day, I was just like, oh, I'll just see what I've got up to quite nonchalantly, and I stood on the scale, and I'm going to be honest, I'm going to use the numbers, which nobody likes talking about either, because I have said to Steph for a very, very long time, I will never reach 14 stone. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Past that makes it very difficult to come back from. I'm not going to do it. And I stood on the scale, and the scale read 13 stone, 13.6. And you know what? I know, terrible, isn't it? Terrible. And you know what? What happened at that moment was really interesting. Because God just said, I'm not happy about that. You're going in the wrong direction. Steps preach fresh in my mind, yoked to Christ. And as I'm going, thinking it's not a problem, the master next to me goes, no, nope, you're going in the wrong direction. We're going this way. It was gentle. It was loving. I tried to excuse it. I tried to say things like, ah, you know what, I'm not as bad as other people. You can quote me on this one. 
And as I was thinking about that, he said, <laughs> he said, what did he say? He said something like, don't, don't define right by normal. Don't define right by normal. We don't do that as God's people. We don't define right by what is normal. That was an interesting, interesting challenge to me, and it's hit me on a lot of things. But he just gently nudged me. So I started exercising again. Humble brag, run 20K this week. Yes, 20K this week. Uh, stopped snacking. I'm eating healthier. I'm sleeping better. And when I reached Sabbath, which we, me and Steph practice every week, when we reached our Saturday, I was more rested from a week where I've done more exercise than I have in weeks before it. The yoke led me into rest, even though it required more of me. And I just want to say this is, there is a truth to this. I do health the way God does health. Now, what might God have saved me from? I don't know. Has he saved me from diabetes, heart attack, low self-esteem, mental anguish? I don't know. I do know that when God directs and I follow, I am led deeper into the life he has for me. Now, it bears saying this, there are people here who need deliverance from health, from sickness, cancer, such like. Yeah, absolutely. God does deliver. I'm not taking away from that. But equally, I think there are many of us who need to start recognizing God as Lord and Savior of our health. And that if we want to see salvation in this area, we need to make God Lord of some decisions. And it doesn't just go to health. Like I say, it goes to all sorts of other stuff. You know, there's a famous verse in 2 Chronicles, often misused, misappropriated in all sorts of ways. But at its heart, it has a principle of the working of God. It goes like this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That verse is directed to the people of God. If my people who are called by my name will do this. To paraphrase that, if you will make me Lord, I will save. God is inviting us to make him Savior by making him Lord. But it works the other way around too. If we make him Lord... We must make him saviour. And you might think, well, of course. But actually, of course, really. You know, there's no place in the system to have Jesus as Lord and not have him shaping and changing you. Have you ever noticed how... <laughs> I noticed this. When someone first comes into your life, before they know Jesus, they, they seem really normal. They're really normal people. Really normal, lovely, wonderful people. Uh, balanced, straight up, sort of, yeah, brilliant people. Then they start coming to church, and then they come to Jesus, and then all of the nuts comes out. All of the crazy comes out. It suddenly becomes clear that they're broken, hurt, insecure. They're shadows of what you thought you were when you first met them. And you go, what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. I have a theory on this. The world teaches us to be really, really, really good at hiding our pain and our brokenness. We learn very well how to pretend none of that is there. But when we come to Jesus and we make him Lord, he won't settle for that. When we come to Jesus and make him Lord, he will start saving. He will start bringing those things up. He will start re restoring and redeeming and doing all of that thing so that we can engage in it and actually be healed from it and saved from it and restored to what he created us to be. I heard a man recently talk about how his granddad taught him to whittle. I thought this was quite funny. You know whittling, where you get a little knife and you cut something out of a stick? And his granddad said, do you know how to whittle a grasshopper out of a piece of wood? And the guy goes, no, I don't. And the, da and the granddad replies, well, you take the piece of wood and you take away everything that doesn't look like a grasshopper. When we come to Jesus, we're a bit like that. We're unshaped works of art. The Bible uses the image of the clay on the potter's wheel. When we put ourselves into the hands of the potter, he is not content to simply go, I'm really pleased I own more clay. 
It's not how he works. When we say, God, I'm going to give myself to you, he doesn't go, brilliant, I'm going to take you, I'm going to stick you on my shelf of clay collection, and sometime in the far, far future, maybe when the clay's dead, I'll move it into a safe place. No, he takes the clay and he says, you've given yourself to me, I'm going to put you and I'm going to shape and restore and redeem and recreate and I'm going to turn you into everything I intended you to be before sin corrupted this. I feel like this is a bit of an odd word, I do. I do think that God wants to say to people who are already following him, make him Lord and Savior. And that for him to save, to truly save, not just to deliver, but to truly save us, and bring us into all he has for us, we have to make him Lord of those areas. In fact, we have to make him Lord of our whole lives. We have to live our lives through the lens of his thoughts. We need to know his thoughts to do that. Through prayer, Bible study, Holy Spirit ministry, fellowship with other believers, wisdom, relying on the wisdom of those that have gone before. All of those things. And that in making him Lord, his plan is to save. That we should stop looking to him for one without the other. But I want to remind as I finish there, this is not a rebuke from God. Don't hear it that way. It's an invitation. It's an invitation from God. An invitation to more. An invitation out of the wilderness, having tasted something of the power of God, and into the promised land, learning to trust him, and take the land. So Father, we just thank you. Thank you, you are absolutely not content to leave us where we are. You won't leave us half finished. You won't leave us 90% complete. But Lord, we also thank you for the direction that says, in some ways, the solution to the problem is that you need to listen to my guidance. You need to do what I'm asking you to do. Father, we just ask that you will land in our hearts now the areas that we know we are facing a problem because we are not doing it your way. And we ask that you guide us lovingly take us by the hand by helping a child climb a mountain give us the next steps make us feel safe in the process of restoring us to what your way would be for us we ask this in Jesus name for the sake of your manifest glory on this earth Amen We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at www.kingschurchwirral.co.uk.